communities here could do so much more. But you're being held back. Potentially the biggest ever transfer of power from Westminster to the British people, according to Labour. To emphasise the point, they launch their ideas not in London, but Leeds. By empowering our towns, cities, regions and nations to work together on local growth plans, Labour will reignite our economy. 40 huge ideas in 155 hefty pages. The party hoping to win back voters who deserted them at the last election. But is this the way to woo them? 2016, a lot of people voted for Brexit because they thought that was their only chance of change. In 2014, a lot of people voted for independence because they thought that was the only change on offer. We are changing that entirely today. The most headline-grabbing recommendation, abolishing this place, the House of Lords, in favour of an elected chamber. We've been interviewing people out and about over the last few months, people who are really struggling with their bills, cost of living. None of them mention things like House of Lords reform. I'm wondering if you feel that this is a priority for people at the minute. Well, the House of Lords uh, reform is one of a huge number of recommendations. What's driving the report, what drives me um, and what will drive the next Labour government is fixing our broken economy and fixing our broken politics. Half of the UK's population live in areas that are poorer than parts of Eastern Europe, according to Labour's analysis. But polling suggests they don't trust politicians to make a change. So how will Labour's big ideas make a difference to people's lives? Rising plumes of acrid smoke bellowed out those words you choke A plan to liberate the working folk Serving hot meals twice a week, the Rainbow Junction is a community cafe in the heart of Leeds. And one day a week we are a food share and that means that we open our doors mm -hmm. and we, two days a week, we cook up amazing meals from surplus food. It smells food. lovely. Um, and we serve meals to 60 or 70 of our neighbours. Wow. So you're getting um, a lot more people coming in. More folks now than a few months ago, than a few years ago. Heston Grunewald says it can be difficult trying to secure funding because the criteria for certain pots of money are dictated by Westminster. So for you, Labour's idea of devolving more power to the regions makes sense? You feel you could reach more people in your communities? It makes a lot of sense because the people on the ground know the people on the ground and so, you know, we, we know our neighbours, we're able to help them out in a way that folks in Westminster don't so much, they're looking at a much bigger picture than we are. We, we have kind of local wisdom and intel. Here you go, my loveliness. Beth Bingley is one of the volunteers here. My granddad was a businessman. He ran two mills with in a Leeds. mill and a silk mill in Leeds. Um, and I've watched everything go in the city. And with the decline of the city's industries, Ms Bingley says many of her family members moved away to London to find better jobs. I've really all my life noticed just how the north gets a really rough deal compared to the south. Um, and I really supported the West Yorkshire Authority. Over Pike, Falkloff and Moor, amongst the Barak and I adore. Levelling up the nations and regions is one of the promises that helped the Tories win their huge majority in 2019. But many here feel those promises weren't kept. Uh, so it's just the basic one that you can just send yeah, texts and stuff right, like that. Yeah. Robert Constable can't afford internet access. He told me it makes it difficult to apply for jobs, which can mean his universal credit is docked. Keir Starmer talking to you, would you vote for him? My grandma used to say to me, it doesn't matter which party's in, they all look after themselves. <coughs> Whichever party's in, they all look after themselves. They're not, they don't give a monkey's fuck. The government says it's already devolving powers to local areas and accused Labour of getting its priorities wrong as the country faces a cost-of-living crisis. Well, a little earlier, I spoke to Baroness Hyman, the former Labour minister who was Lord Speaker of the House of Lords between 2006 and 2011. I began by asking her if Labour's plan for more elected democracy was a good thing. I think there's a lot that needs to be done to change the House of Lords. What I'm not convinced about is that we need another elected chamber because I think there are real problems about ensuring that democratic accountability is in one place and very clear uh, and a lot of danger of two elected houses 
becoming either rivals or the second house becoming a poor relation, poor replica of the first. So you don't want to be abolished, is that it? Well, I think, to give them credit, the proposals are not for abolition, they're for replacement. They're not saying we should become unicameral and only have one chamber. Um, but I do think a lot of danger that you could spend weeks, months, years debating what to do, what sort of second chamber you want, when actually there's quite a consensus around the fact that what the House of Lords does, scrutinising legislation very carefully, having experts select committees, uh, taking up issues and working on a cross-party basis on them, is actually valuable. What people get very worried about is the size of the House of Lords and the appointment process for the House of Lords, and I think we should tackle those first. What sort of damage do you think the current appointments process is doing? I think the current process and the way it has been used and abused um, by recent prime ministers uh, is doing a lot of harm because everyone gets tarred by the same brush. People who have had lifetimes of public service, hugely successful careers and want to come and give their advice and their import on science, on medicine, on technology, on the voluntary sector, and do that in the House of Lords, are being thought of as cronies or people who give uh, large amounts uh, of donations to political parties. That isn't the majority of the House of Lords. It happens sometimes. Uh, it has happened that prime ministers have not taken the advice of the House of Lords Appointments Commission, which doesn't have the power to stand in the way of a prime minister at the moment, and that causes huge public disquiet. And I understand that, and I sympathise, and I share that. Baroness Heyman, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Well, I put some of those points to Ian Murray, the Shadow Scotland Secretary, who joined me from Edinburgh a little earlier. I started by asking whether the voters he meets on the doorstep actually care about reforming the House of Lords. No, but what they tell us is that they think politics is uh, very much uh, divorced from their uh, daily lives. What they tell us is they don't feel as if they're getting an economic share uh, of the pie. And whether people voted yes or no in the Scottish referendum or leave or remain uh, across the UK, what they were saying to us is they wanted a bigger stake in how decisions uh, are made. And part of the report, the major part of the report, is about economic devolution. It's about nearly 300 clusters uh, of economic activity across the country and giving people the powers and the ability to make decisions to work together and to grow the economy. And do you think this is a thing that will excite voters into voting for Labour? Uh, well, this is all part of a manifesto that will be uh, radical, and it's right that we look at what's going on at the moment in terms of Westminster. We have 830 uh, unelected uh, members of the House of Lords now. What we want to do is modernise our politics, modernise our institutions, clean up and clear out the centre. Isn't there a danger, though, that you're creating a rival chamber to the House of Commons, essentially composed of other elected politicians? Uh, well, we need a primary chamber. The House of Commons will always be the primary chamber, and the rules and regulations of the new secondary chamber will be very much defined uh, in law. It will be what they do at the moment in terms of amending uh, legislation. It will also have this primary function, uh, this secondary function, this new function of upholding the constitution and the rules uh, and the parliamentary uh, rules as well. And it will also reflect the nations and regions of the United Kingdom, bringing uh, the decision-making powers uh, and those powers in a secondary chamber from all over uh, the country, rather than it being 830 uh, appointed or unelected House of Lords that we have uh, at the moment. The thing is, this is all very well as a radical proposal. In reality, you will end up in a quagmire. It's just not going to happen, is it? Uh, well, Keir Starmer was incredibly clear today. He doesn't want to be consulting on this when he goes into Downing Street. He wants to be implementing this and delivering it, which is why the consultation will happen now. The details will be thrashed out. It will go into the manifesto and we'll get on with doing the work of delivering this for the entirety of the United Kingdom on day one of a Labour government. That's his commitment and that's what he will be doing as Prime Minister. But if you want to give power to the people, as it were, why don't you back a referendum on an independent Scotland? 
Uh, well, the debate in Scotland at the moment has been very much between a broken status quo that we have at the moment and separating from the United Kingdom. And what we're putting forward today is a really radical set of proposals uh, that say to the Scottish people, you have a choice now between change outside the United Kingdom or change within a transformed United Kingdom with a UK uh, Labour government. That's the proposition uh, that's on the table. One of the advantages of the current House of Lords, in theory at least, is you have public servants who aren't just thinking about the next election, they're thinking long term. You're not worried about losing that at all? Uh, well, look, the secondary chamber in America, for example, in terms of the Senate, only has 100 members for 260 million people. We have 830 members of the House of Lords unelected for 65 million people and growing. It shouldn't be a chamber that's used anymore for the Prime Minister to put his cronies in there, his donors to the party, or anybody he feels as if he owes a favour to. That needs to uh, stop, and the best way of doing that is to reform the second chamber. I mean, if you're looking at the US as an example, it's worth thinking about how they end up in constant electoral ping pong. It's harder to get legislation passed than the same in France. So aren't you going to end up in the same situation? Uh, well, no, because the way in which this secondary chamber would operate would be to be a revising chamber as it is at the moment. It wouldn't have the power as it does at the moment to essentially just trash a government's programme by um, holding up legislation for uh, more than a year as it can do at, at the moment. So it wouldn't really have any power at all. It's just a talking shop. Uh, well, no, because it will have the power, as the current House of Lords has, to amend any piece of UK legislation that comes from the House of Commons. That is currently uh, what the House of Lords uh, sits for. So it will be uh, powerful, it will do the job that the current House of Lords does with ed additional uh, responsibilities for upholding the Constitution. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. Ian Murray, thank you very much for joining us.